On the Lapsed by Cyprian Behold, beloved brethren, peace is restored to the church, and although it lately seemed to incredulous people difficult and to traitors impossible, our security is by divine aid and retribution re-established. Our minds return to gladness, and the season of affliction and the cloud being dispersed, tranquillity and serenity have shone forth once more. Praises must be given to God, and his benefits and gifts must be celebrated with giving of thanks, although even in the time of persecution our voice has not ceased to give thanks, for not even an enemy has so much power as to prevent us who love the Lord with our whole heart and life and strength from declaring his blessings and praises always and everywhere with glory. The day earnestly desired by the prayers of all has come, and after the dreadful and loathsome darkness of a long night, the world has shone forth irradiated by the light of the Lord. We look with glad countenances upon confessors, illustrious with the heraldry of a good name, and glorious with the praises of virtue and of faith. Clinging to them with holy kisses, we embrace them long desired with insatiable eagerness. The white-robed cohort of Christ's soldiers is here, who in the fierce conflict have broken the ferocious turbulence of an urgent persecution, having been prepared for the suffering of the dungeon, armed for the endurance of death. Bravely you have resisted the world, you have afforded a glorious spectacle in the sight of God, you have been an example to your brethren that shall follow you. That religious voice has named the name of Christ, in whom it has once confessed that it believed, those illustrious hands, which had only been accustomed to divine works, have resisted the sacrilegious sacrifices, whose lips sanctified by heavenly food after the body and blood of the Lord have rejected the profane contacts and the leavings of the idols. Your head has remained free from the impious and wicked veil with which the captive heads of those who sacrificed were there veiled. Your brow, pure with the sign of God, could not bear the crown of the devil, but reserved itself for the Lord's crown. How joyously does your mother church receive you in her bosom as you return from the battle! How blissfully, how gladly does she open her gates, that in united bands you may enter, bearing the trophies from a prostrate enemy! With the triumphing men come women also, who, while contending with the world, have also overcome their sex, and virgins also come with the double glory of their warfare, and boys transcending their years with their virtues. Moreover, also, the rest of the multitude of those who stand fast follow your glory and accompany your footsteps with the insignia of praise, very near to and almost joined with your own. In them also is the same sincerity of heart, the same soundness of a tenacious faith, resting on the unshaken roots of the heavenly precepts and strengthened by the evangelical traditions, the prescribed banishment, the destined tortures, the loss of property, the bodily punishments have not terrified them. The days for testing their faith were limited beforehand, but he who remembers that he has renounced the world knows no day of worldly appointment, neither does he who hopes for eternity from God calculate the seasons of earth any more. Let none, my beloved brethren, let none depreciate this glory, let none by malignant dispraise detract from the uncorrupted steadfastness of those who have stood. When the day appointed for denying was gone by, Every one who had not professed within that time not to be a Christian confessed that he was a Christian. It is the first title to victory to confess the Lord under the violence of the hands of the Gentiles. It is the second step to glory to be withdrawn by a cautious retirement and to be reserved for the Lord. The former is a public, the latter is a private confession. The former overcomes the judge of this world, the latter, content with God as its judge, keeps a pure conscience in integrity of heart. In the former case there is a readier fortitude, in the latter solicitude is more secure. The former, as his hour approached, was already found mature, the latter perhaps was delayed, who, leaving his estate, withdrew for a while, because he would not deny, but would certainly confess if he too had been apprehended. One cause of grief saddens these heavenly crowns of martyrs, these glorious spiritual confessions, these very great and illustrious virtues of the brethren who stand, which is that the hostile violence has torn away a part of our own bowels and thrown it away in the destructiveness of its own cruelty. What shall I do in this matter, beloved brethren? Wavering in the various tide of feeling, what or how shall I speak? I need tears rather than words to express the sorrow with which the wound of our body should be bewailed, with which the manifold loss of a people once numerous should be lamented. 
For whose heart is so hard or cruel, who is so unmindful of brotherly love, as among the varied ruins of his friends, and the mournful relics disfigured with all degeneration, to be able to stand and to keep dry eyes, and not in the breaking out of his grief, to express his groanings rather with tears than with words. I grieve, brethren, I grieve with you, nor does my own integrity and my personal soundness beguile me to the soothing of my griefs, since it is the shepherd that is chiefly wounded in the wound of his flock. I join my breast with each one, and I share in the grievous burden of sorrow and mourning. I wail with the wailing, I weep with the weeping, I regard myself as prostrated with those who are prostrate. My limbs are at the same time stricken with those darts of the raging enemy, their cruel swords have pierced through my bowels, my mind could not remain untouched and free from the inroad of persecution among my downfall and brethren, sympathy has cast me down also. Yet, beloved brethren, the cause of truth is to be had in view, nor ought the gloomy darkness of the terrible persecution so to have blinded the mind and feeling that there should remain no light or illumination whence the divine precepts may be beheld. If the cause of disaster is recognized, there is at once found a remedy for the wound. The Lord has desired his family to be proved, and because a long peace has corrupted the discipline that has been divinely delivered to us, the heavenly rebuke has aroused our faith, which was giving way, and I had almost said slumbering, and although we deserved more for our sins, yet the most merciful Lord has so moderated all things, that all which has transpired has rather seemed a trial than a persecution. Each one was desirous of increasing his estate, and forgetful of what believers had either done before in the times of the apostles, or always ought to do, they, with the insatiable ardour of covetousness, devoted themselves to the increase of their property. Among the priests there was no devotedness of religion, among the ministers there was no sound faith, in their works there was no mercy, in their manners there was no discipline. In men their beards were defaced, in women their complexion was dyed, the eyes were falsified from what God's hand had made them, their hair was stained with a falsehood. Crafty frauds were used to deceive the hearts of the simple, subtle meanings for circumventing the brethren. They united in the bond of marriage with unbelievers, they prostituted the members of Christ to the Gentiles. They would swear not only rashly, but even more would swear falsely, would despise those set over them with haughty swelling, would speak evil of one another with envenomed tongue would quarrel with one another with obstinate hatred. Very many bishops who ought to furnish both exhortation and example to others, despising their divine charge, became agents in secular business, forsook their throne, deserted their people, wandered about over foreign provinces, hunted the markets for gainful merchandise, while brethren were starving in the church. They sought to possess money in hoards, they seized estates by crafty deceits, they increased their gains by multiplying usuries. What do not such as we deserve to suffer for sins of this kind, when even already the divine rebuke has forewarned us, and said, If they shall forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they shall profane my statutes, and shall not observe my precepts, I will visit their offences with a rod, and their sins with scourges. These things were before declared to us and predicted. But we, forgetful of the law and obedience required of us, have so acted by our sins that, while we despise the Lord's commandments, we have come by severer remedies to the correction of our sin and probation of our faith. Nor indeed have we at last been converted to the fear of the Lord, so as to undergo patiently and courageously this our correction and divine proof. Immediately at the first words of the threatening foe, the greatest number of the brethren betrayed their faith and were cast down, not by the onset of persecution, but cast themselves down by voluntary lapse. What unheard of thing, I beg you, what new thing had happened, that, as if on the occurrence of things unknown and unexpected, the obligation to Christ should be dissolved with headlong rashness. Have not prophets aforetime and subsequently apostles told of these things? Have not they, full of the Holy Spirit, predicted the afflictions of the righteous, and always the injuries of the heathens? Does not the sacred scripture which ever arms our faith and strengthens with a voice from heaven the servants of God, say, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve? Does it not again show the anger of the divine indignation, and warn of the fear of punishment beforehand, when it says, They worshipped them whom their fingers have made, and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, and I will forgive them not? And again God speaks and says, 
He that sacrifices unto any gods, save unto the Lord only, shall be destroyed. In the gospel also subsequently the Lord, who instructs by his words and fulfills by his deeds, teaching what should be done, and doing whatever he had taught, did he not before admonish us of whatever is now done and shall be done? Did he not before ordain both for those who deny him eternal punishments, and for those that confess him saving rewards? From some uh, misery all these things have fallen away and have passed from memory. They indeed did not wait to be apprehended ere they ascended, or to be interrogated ere they denied. Many were conquered before the battle, prostrated before the attack, nor did they even leave it to be said for them that they seemed to sacrifice to idols unwillingly. They ran to the marketplace of their own accord. Freely they hastened to death, as if they had formerly wished it, as if they would embrace an opportunity now given which they had always desired. How many were put off by the magistrates at that time, when evening was coming on? How many even asked that their destruction might not be delayed? What violence can such an one plead as an excuse? How can he purge his crime when it was he himself who rather used force to bring about his own ruin? When they came voluntarily to the capital, when they freely approached to the obedience of the terrible wickedness, did not their tread falter? Did not their sight darken, their heart tremble, their arms fall helplessly down? Did not their senses fail, their tongue cleave to their mouth, their speech grow weak? Could the servant of God stand there and speak and renounce Christ when he had already renounced the devil and the world? Was not that altar, whither he drew near to perish, to him a funeral pyre? Ought he not to shudder at and flee from the devil's altar, which he had seen to smoke, and to be redolent of a foul feeder, as if it were the funeral and sepulchre of his life? Why bring with you, a wretched man, a sacrifice? Why immolate a victim? You yourself have come to the altar and offering, you yourself have come a victim. There you have immolated your salvation, your hope. There you have burnt up your faith in those deadly fires. But to many their own destruction was not sufficient. With mutual exhortations people were urged to their ruin. Death was pledged by turns in the deadly cup. And that nothing might be wanting to aggravate the crime, infants also in the arms of their parents either carried or conducted, lost while yet little ones, what in the very first beginning of their nativity they had gained. Will not they, when the day of judgment comes, say, We have done nothing, nor have we forsaken the Lord's bread and cup to hasten freely to a profane contact? The faithlessness of others has ruined us. We have found our parents, our murderers. They have denied to us the church as a mother. They have denied God as a father. So that, while we were little and unforeseeing and unconscious of such a crime, we were associated by others to the partnership of wickedness, and we were snared by the deceit of others." Nor is there, alas, any just and weighty reason which excuses such a crime. One's country was to be left, and loss of one's estate was to be suffered. Yet to whom that is born and dies is there not a necessity at some time to leave his country and to suffer the loss of his estate? But let not Christ be forsaken, so that the loss of salvation and of an eternal home should be feared. Behold, the Holy Spirit cries by the prophet, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch not the unclean thing, go ye out from the midst of her, and be ye separate, that bear the vessels of the Lord. Yet those who are the vessels of the Lord and the temple of God do not go out from the midst, nor depart, that they may not be compelled to touch the unclean thing, and to be polluted and corrupted with deadly food. Elsewhere also a voice is heard from heaven, forewarning what is becoming for the servants of God to do, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. He who goes out and departs does not become a partaker of the guilt, but he will be wounded with the plagues who is found a companion in the crime. And therefore the Lord commanded us in the persecution to depart and to flee, and both taught that this should be done, and he himself did. For as the crown is given of the condescension of God, and cannot be received unless the hour comes for accepting it, whosoever abiding in Christ departs for a while, does not deny his faith, but waits for the time. But he who has fallen after refusing to depart remained to deny it. The truth, brethren, must not be disguised, nor must the matter and cause of our wound be concealed. A blind lava one's own property has deceived many, nor could they be prepared for or at ease in, departing when their wealth fettered them like a chain. Those were the chains to them that remained, 
those were the bonds by which both virtue was retarded and faith burdened and the spirit bound and the soul hindered so that they who were involved in earthly things might become a booty and food for the serpent which according to god's sentence feeds upon earth and therefore the lord the teacher of good things for warning for the future time says if thou wilt be perfect go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me if rich men did this they would not perish by their riches if they laid up treasure in heaven they would not now have a domestic enemy and assailant heart and mind and feeling would be in heaven if the treasure were in heaven nor could he be overcome by the world who had nothing in the world whereby he could be overcome he would follow the lord loosed and free as did the apostles and many in the times of the apostles and many who forsook both their means and their relatives and clave to christ with undivided ties but how can they follow christ who are held back by the chain of their wealth or how can they seek heaven and climb to sublime and lofty heights who are weighed down by earthly desires they think that they possess when they are rather possessed as slaves of their profit and not lords with respect to their own money but rather the bond slaves of their money these times and these men are indicated by the apostle when he says but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and in perdition for the root of all evil is the love of money which while some have coveted they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows but with what rewards does the lord invite us to contempt of worldly wealth with what compensations does he atone for the small and trifling losses of this present time there is no man saith he that leaves house or land or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of god's sake but he shall receive sevenfold even in this time but in the world to come life everlasting if we know these things and have found them out from the truth of the lord who promises not only is not loss of this kind to be feared but even to be desired as the lord himself again announces and warns us blessed are ye when men shall persecute you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall cast you out and shall speak of your name as evil for the son of man's sake rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven but say they subsequently tortures had come and severe sufferings were threatening those who resisted he may complain of tortures who has been overcome by tortures he may offer the excuse of suffering who has been vanquished in suffering such an one may ask and say i wished indeed to strive bravely and remembering my oath i took up the arms of devotion and faith but as i was struggling in the encounter varied tortures and long continued sufferings overcame me my mind stood firm and my faith was strong and my soul struggled long unshaken with the torturing pains but when with the renewed barbarity of the most cruel judge wearied out as i was the scourges were now tearing me the clubs bruised me the rack strained me the claw dug into me the fire roasted me my flesh deserted me in the struggle the weakness of my bodily frame gave way not my mind but my body yielded in the suffering such a plea may readily avail to forgiveness an apology of that kind may excite compassion thus at one time the lord forgave castus and amelius thus overcome in the first encounter they were made victors in the second battle so that they who had formerly given way to the fires became stronger than the fires and in that in which they had been vanquished they were conquerors they entreated not for pity of their tears but of their wounds nor with a lamentable voice alone but with laceration and suffering of body blood flowed instead of weeping and instead of tears gore poured forth from their half-scorched entrails but now what wounds can those who are overcome show what gashes of gaping entrails what tortures of the limbs in cases where it was not faith that fell in the encounter but faithlessness that anticipated the struggle nor does the necessity of the crime excuse the person compelled where the crime is committed of free will nor do i say this in such a way as that i would burden the cases of the brethren but that i may rather instigate the brethren to a prayer of atonement for as it is written they who call you happy cause you to err and destroy the paths of your feet he who soothes the sinner with flattering blandishments furnishes the stimulus to sin nor does he repress but nourishes wrongdoing but he who with braver counsels rebukes at the same time that he instructs a brother urges him onward to salvation as many as i love saith the lord i rebuke and chasten 
and thus also it behoves the lord's priest not to mislead by deceiving concessions but to provide with salutary remedies he is an unskilful physician who handles the swelling edges of wounds with a tender hand and by retaining the poison shut up in the deep recesses of the body increases it the wound must be opened and cut and healed by the stronger remedy of cutting out the corrupting parts the sick man may cry out may vociferate and may complain in impatience of the pain but he will afterwards give thanks when he has felt that he is cured moreover beloved brethren a new kind of devastation has appeared and as if the storm of persecution had raged too little there has been added to the heap under the title of mercy a deceiving mischief and a fair-seeming calamity contrary to the vigour of the gospel contrary to the law of the lord and god by the temerity of some communion is relaxed to heedless persons a vain and false peace dangerous to those who grant it and likely to avail nothing to those who receive it they do not seek for the patience necessary to health nor the true medicine derived from atonement penitence is driven forth from their breasts and the memory of their very grave and extreme sin is taken away the wounds of the dying are covered over and the deadly blow that is planted in the deep and secret entrails is concealed by a dissimulated suffering returning from the altars of the devil they draw near to the holy place of the lord with hands filthy and reeking with smell still almost breathing of the plague-bearing idol meats and even with jaws still exhaling their crime and reeking with the fatal contact they intrude on the body of the lord although the sacred scripture stands in their way and cries saying every one that is clean shall eat of the flesh and whatever soul eateth of the flesh of the saving sacrifice which is the lord's having his uncleanness upon him that soul shall be cut off from his people also the apostle testifies and says ye cannot drink the cup of the lord and the cup of devils ye cannot be partakers of the lord's table and of the table of devils he threatens moreover the stubborn and froward and denounces them saying whosoever eateth the bread or drinketh the cup of the lord unworthily is guilty of the body and blood of the lord all these warnings being scorned and contemned before their sin is expiated before confession has been made of their crime before their conscience has been purged by sacrifice and by the hand of the priest before the offence of an angry and threatening lord has been appeased violence is done to his body and blood and they sin now against their lord more with their hand and mouth than when they denied their lord they think that that is peace which some with deceiving words are blazoning forth that is not peace but war and he is not joined to the church who is separated from the gospel why do they call an injury a kindness why do they call impiety by the name of piety why do they hinder those who ought to weep continually and to entreat their lord from the sorrowing of repentance and pretend to receive them to communion this is the same kind of thing to the lapsed as hail to the harvests as the stormy star to the trees as the destruction of pestilence to the herds as the raging tempest to shipping they take away the consolation of eternal hope they overturn the tree from the roots they creep on to a deadly contagion with their pestilent words they dash the ship on the rocks so that it may not reach to the harbour such a facility does not grant peace but takes it away nor does it give communion but it hinders from salvation this is another persecution and another temptation by which the crafty enemy still further assaults the lapsed attacking them by a secret corruption that their lamentation may be hushed that their grief may be silent that the memory of their sin may pass away that the groaning of their heart may be repressed that the weeping of their eyes may be quenched nor long and full penitence depreciate the lord so grievously offended although it is written remember from whence thou art fallen and repent let no one cheat himself let no one deceive himself the lord alone can have mercy he alone can bestow pardon for sins which have been committed against himself who bear our sins who sorrowed for us whom god delivered up for our sins man cannot be greater than god nor can a servant remit or forego by his indulgence what has been committed by a greater crime against the lord lest to the person lapsed this be moreover added to his sin if he be ignorant that it is declared cursed is the man that putteth his hope in man the lord must be besought the lord must be appeased by our atonement who has said that him that denieth him he will deny who alone has received all judgment from his father we believe indeed that the merits of martyrs and the works of the righteous are of great avail with the judge but that will be when the day of judgment shall come when after the conclusion of this life and the world his people shall stand before the tribunal of god
but if any one by an overhurried haste rashly thinks that he can give remission of sins to all or dares to rescind the lord's precepts not only does it in no respect advantage the lapsed but it does them harm not to have observed his judgment is to have provoked his wrath and to think that the mercy of god must not first of all be entreated and despising the lord to presume on his power under the altar of god the souls of the slain martyrs cry with a loud voice saying how long o lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon those who dwell on the earth and they are bidden to rest and still to keep patience and does not any one think that in opposition to the judge a man can become of avail for the general remission and pardon of sins or that he can shield others before he himself is vindicated the martyrs order something to be done but only if this thing be just and lawful if it can be done without opposing the lord himself by god's priest if the consent of the obeying party be easy and yielding if the moderation of the asking party be religious the martyrs order something to be done but if what they order be not written in the law of the lord we must first know that they have obtained what they ask from god and then do what they command for that may not always appear to be immediately conceded by the divine majesty which has been promised by man's undertaking for moses also besought for the sins of the people and yet when he had sought pardon for these sinners he did not receive it i pray thee said he o lord this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin forgive it but if not blot me out of the book which thou hast written and the lord said unto moses whosoever hath sinned against me him will i blot out of my book he the friend of god he who had often spoken face to face with the lord could not obtain what he asked nor could appease the wrath of an indignant god by his entreaty god praises jeremiah and announces saying before i formed thee in the belly i knew thee and before thou camest out of the womb i sanctified thee and i ordained thee a prophet unto the nations and to the same man he saith when he often entreated and prayed for the sins of the people pray not thou for this people neither lift up cry nor prayer for them for i will not hear them in the time wherein they call on me in the time of their affliction but who was more righteous than noah who when the earth was filled with sins was alone found righteous on the earth who more glorious than daniel who more strong for suffering martyrdom in firmness of faith more happy in god's condescension who so many times both when he was in conflict conquered and when he had conquered lived on was any more ready in good works than job braver in temptations more patient in sufferings more submissive in his fear more true in his faith and yet god said that he would not grant to them if they were to seek when the prophet ezekiel entreated for the sin of the people whatsoever land said he shall sin against me by trespassing grievously i will stretch out mine hand upon it and i will break the staff of bread thereof and i will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it though these three men noah daniel and job were in it they should deliver neither sons nor daughters but they only should be delivered themselves thus not everything that is asked is in the prejudgment of the asker but in the free will of the giver neither can human judgment claim to itself or usurp anything unless the divine pleasure approve in the gospel the lord speaks and says whosoever shall confess me before men him will i also confess before my father which is in heaven but he that denieth me him will i also deny if he does not deny him that denies neither does he confess him that confesses the gospel cannot be sound in one part and waver in another either both must stand firm or both must lose the force of truth if they who deny shall not be guilty of a crime neither shall they who confess receive the reward of a virtue again if faith which has conquered be crowned it is of necessity that faithlessness which is conquered should be punished thus the martyrs can either do nothing if the gospel may be broken or if the gospel cannot be broken they can do nothing against the gospel since they become martyrs on account of the gospel let no one beloved brethren let no one decry the dignity of martyrs let no one degrade their glories and their crowns the strength of their uncorrupted faith abides sound nor can he either say or do anything against christ whose hope and faith and virtue and glory are all in christ those cannot be the authority for the bishops doing anything against god's command who themselves have done god's command 
Is anyone greater than God or more merciful than God's goodness, that he should either wish that undone which God has suffered to be done, or, as if God had too little power to protect his church, should think that we could be preserved by his help? Unless, perchance, these things have been done without God's knowledge, or all these things have transpired without his permission, or all these things have transpired without his permission, although Holy Scripture teaches the indocile and admonishes the unmindful, where it speaks, saying, Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to those who made a booty of him? Did not the Lord, against whom they sinned, and would not walk in his ways, neither were obedient unto his law? And he has poured upon them the fury of his anger. And elsewhere it testifies and says, Is the Lord's hand shortened, that it cannot save, or his ear heavy, that it cannot hear? But your iniquities separate between you and your God, and because of your sins he hath hid his face from you, that he may not have mercy. Let us rather consider our offences, revolving our doings and the secrets of our mind. Let us weigh the deserts of our conscience. Let it come back upon our heart that we have not walked in the Lord's ways, and have cast away God's law, and have never been willing to keep his precepts and saving counsels. What good can you think of him? What fear can you suppose to have been with him, or what faith? whom neither fear could correct nor persecution itself could reform. His high and rigid neck, even when it has fallen, is unbent. His swelling and haughty soul is not broken, even when it is conquered. Prostrate he threatens those who stand, and wounded the sound. And because he may not at once receive the body of the Lord in his polluted hands, the sacrilegious one is angry with the priests. And... O oh, your excessive madness, O frantic one, you are angry with him who endeavours to avert the anger of God from you. You threaten him who beseeches the divine mercy on your behalf, who feels your wound which you yourself do not feel, who sheds tears for you which perhaps you never shed yourself. You are still aggravating and enhancing your crime, and while you yourself are implacable against the ministers and priests of God, do you think that the Lord can be appeased concerning you? Receive rather and admit what we say. Why do your deaf ears not hear the salutary precepts with which we warn you? Why do your blind eyes not see the way of repentance which we point out? Why does your stricken and alienated mind not perceive the lively remedies which we both learn and teach from the heavenly scriptures? Or, if some unbelievers have little faith in future events, let them be terrified with present ones. Lo, what punishments do we behold of those who have denied? What sad deaths of theirs do we bewail? Not even here can they be without punishment, although the day of punishment has not yet arrived. Some are punished in the meantime, that others may be corrected. The torments of a few are the examples of all. One of those who of his own will ascended the capital to make denial, after he had denied Christ, became dumb. The punishment began from that point whence the crime also began, so that now he could not ask, since he had no words for entreating mercy. Another, who was in the baths, for this was wanting to her crime and to her misfortunes, that she even went at once to the baths, when she had lost the grace of the laver of life. There, unclean as she was, was seized by an unclean spirit, and tore with her teeth the tongue with which she had either impiously eaten or spoken. After the wicked food had been taken, the madness of the mouth was armed to its own destruction. She herself was her own executioner, nor did she long continue to live afterwards, tortured with pangs of the belly and bowels, she expired. Learn what occurred when I myself was present, and a witness. Some parents, who by chance were escaping, being little careful on account of their terror, left a little daughter under the care of a wet nurse. The nurse gave up the forsaken child to the magistrates. They gave it, in the presence of an idol, whither the people flocked, because it was not yet able to eat flesh on account of its years, bread mingled with wine, which, however, itself was the remainder of what had been used in the immolation of those that had perished. Subsequently the mother recovered her child, but the girl was no more able to speak or to indicate the crime that had been committed than she had before been able to understand or to prevent it. Therefore it happened unawares in their ignorance that when they were sacrificing the mother brought it in with her. Moreover, the girl mingled with the saints, became impatient of our prayer and supplications, 
and was at one moment shaken with weeping and at another tossed about like a wave of the sea by the violent excitement of her mind as if by the compulsion of a torturer the soul of that still tender child confessed a consciousness of the fact with such signs as it could when however the solemnities were finished and the deacon began to offer the cup to those present and when as the rest received it its turn approached the little child by the instinct of the divine majesty turned away its face compressed its mouth with resisting lips and refused the cup still the deacon persisted and although against her efforts forced on her some of the sacrament of the cup then there followed a sobbing and vomiting in a profaned body and mouth the eucharist could not remain the draught sanctified in the blood of the lord burst forth from the polluted stomach so great is the lord's power so great is his majesty the secrets of darkness were disclosed under his light and not even hidden crimes deceived god's priest this much about an infant which was not yet of an age to speak of the crime committed by others in respect of herself but the woman who in advanced age and of more mature age secretly crept in among us when we were sacrificing received not food but a sword for herself and as if taking some deadly poison into her jaws and body began presently to be tortured and to become stiffened with frenzy and suffering the misery no longer of persecution but of her crime shivering and trembling she fell down the crime of her dissimulated conscience was not long unpunished or concealed she who had deceived man felt that god was taking vengeance and another woman when she tried with unworthy hands to open her box in which was the holy body of the lord was deterred by fire rising from it from daring to touch it and when one who himself was defiled dared with the rest to receive secretly a part of the sacrifice celebrated by the priest he could not eat or handle the holy of the lord but found in his hands when he opened that he had a cinder thus by the experience of one it was shown that the lord withdraws when he is denied nor does that which is received benefit the undeserving for salvation since saving grace is changed by the departure of the sanctity into a cinder how many there are daily who do not repent nor make confession of the consciousness of their crime who are filled with unclean spirits how many are shaken even to the unsoundness of mind and idiocy by the raging of madness nor is there any need to go through the deaths of individuals since through the manifold lapses occurring in the world the punishment of their sins is as varied as the multitude of sinners is abundant let each one consider not what another has suffered but what he himself deserves to suffer nor think that he has escaped if his punishment delay for a time since he ought to fear it the more that the wrath of god the judge has reserved it for himself nor let those persons flatter themselves that they need repent the less who although they have not polluted their hands with abominable sacrifices yet have defiled their consciences with certificates that profession of one who denies is the testimony of a christian disowning what he had been he says that he has done what another has actually committed and although it is written ye cannot serve two masters he has served an earthly master in that he has obeyed his edict he has been more obedient to human authority than to god it matters not whether he has punished what he has done with less either of disgrace or of guilt among men be that as it may he will not be able to escape and avoid god his judge seeing that the holy spirit says in the psalms thine eyes did see my substance that it was imperfect and in thy book shall all men be written and again man seeth the outward appearance but god seeth the heart the lord himself also forewarns and prepares us saying and all the churches shall know that i am he which searcheth the reins and the heart he looks into the hidden and secret things and considers those things which are concealed nor can any one evade the eyes of the lord who says i am a god at hand and not a god afar off if a man may be hidden in secret places shall not i therefore see him do not i fill heaven and earth he sees the heart and mind of every person and he will judge not alone of our deeds but even of our words and thoughts he looks into minds and the wills and conceptions of all men in the very lurking places of the heart that is still closed up moreover how much are they both greater in faith and better in their fear who although bound by no crime of sacrifice or of certificate yet since they have even thought of such things with grief and simplicity confess this very thing to god's priests and make the conscientious avowal put off from them the loads of their minds and seek out the salutary medicine even for slight and moderate wounds knowing that it is written god is not mocked 
God cannot be mocked, nor deceived, nor deluded by any deceptive cunning. Yea, he sins the more, who, thinking that God is like man, believes that he evades the penalty of his crime if he has not openly admitted his crime. Christ says in his precepts, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And does he think that he is a Christian who is either ashamed or afraid to be a Christian? How can he be one with Christ who either blushes or fears to belong to Christ? He will certainly have sinned less by not seeing the idols and not profaning the sanctity of the faith under the eyes of a people standing round and insulting and not polluting his hands by the deadly sacrifices nor defiling his lips with the wicked food. This is advantageous to this extent that the fault is less, not that the conscience is guiltless. He can more easily attain a pardon of his crime, yet he is not free from crime, and let him not cease to carry out his repentance and to entreat the Lord's mercy, lest what seems to be less in the quality of his fault should be increased by his neglect of atonement. I entreat you, beloved brethren, that each one should confess his own sin, while he who has sinned is still in this world, while his confession may be received, while the satisfaction and remission made by the priests are pleasing to the Lord. Let us turn to the Lord with our whole heart, and, expressing our repentance for our sin with true grief, let us entreat God's mercy. Let our soul lie low before him, let our mourning atone to him, let all our hope lean upon him. He himself tells us in what manner we ought to ask. Turn ye, he says, to me with all your heart, and at the same time with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments. Let us return to the Lord with our whole heart. Let us appease his wrath and indignation with fastings, with weeping, with mourning, as he himself admonishes us. Do we believe that a man is lamenting with his whole heart, that he is entreating the Lord with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, who from the first day of his sin daily frequents the bathing places with women, who, feeding at rich banquets and puffed out with fuller dainties, belches forth on the next day his indigestions, and does not dispense of his meat and drink so as to aid the necessity of the poor? How does he who walks with joyous and glad step mourn for his death? And although it is written, Ye shall not mar the figure of your beard, he plucks out his beard and dresses his hair. And does he now study to please any one who displeases God? Or does she groan and lament, who has time to put on the clothing of precious apparel, and not to consider the robe of Christ which she has lost, to receive valuable ornaments and richly wrought necklaces, and not to bewail the loss of divine and heavenly ornament? Although thou clothest thyself in foreign garments and silken robes, thou art naked. Although thou adornest thyself to excess both in pearls and gems and gold, yet without the adornment of Christ thou art unsightly. And you who stain your hair, now at least cease in the midst of sorrows, and you who paint the edges of your eyes with a line drawn around them of black powder, now at least wash your eyes with tears. If you had lost any dear one of your friends by the death incident to mortality, you would groan grievously and weep with disordered countenance, with changed dress, with neglected hair, with clouded face, with dejected appearance, you would show the signs of grief. Miserable creatures, you have lost your soul, spiritually dead, here you are continuing to live to yourself, and although yourself walking about, you have begun to carry your own death with you. And do you not bitterly moan? Do you not continually groan? Do you not hide yourself, either for shame of your sin or for continuance of your lamentation? Behold, these are still worse wounds of sinning. Behold, these are greater crimes, to have sinned and not to make atonement, to have committed crimes and not to bewail your crimes. Ananias, Azarias, and Misael, the illustrious and noble youths, even amidst the flames and the ardours of a raging furnace, did not desist from making public confession to God, although possessed of a good conscience and having often deserved well of the Lord by obedience of faith and fear, yet they did not cease from maintaining their humility and from making atonement to the Lord, even amid the glorious martyrdoms of their virtues. The sacred scripture speaks, saying, Azarias stood up and prayed, and opening his mouth made confession before God, together with his companions in the midst of the fire. Daniel also, after the manifold grace of his faith and innocency, after the condescension of the Lord, often repeated in respect of his virtues and praises, strives by fasting still further to deserve well of God, wraps himself in sackcloth and ashes, sorrowfully making confession and saying, 
O Lord God, great and strong and dreadful, keeping thy covenant and mercy for them that love thee and keep thy commandments, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, we have transgressed and departed from thy precepts and from thy judgments, neither have we hearkened to the words of thy servants, the prophets, which they spake in thy name to our kings and to all the nations and to all the earth. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion. These things were done by men, meek, simple, innocent, in deserving well of the majesty of God. And now those who have denied the Lord refuse to make atonement to the Lord and to entreat him. I beg you, brethren, acquiesce in wholesome remedies, obey better counsels, associate your tears with our tears, join your groans with ours. We beseech you in order that we may beseech God for you. We turn our very prayers to you first, our prayers with which we pray God for you that he would pity you. Repent abundantly, prove the sorrow of a grieving and lamenting mind. Neither let that imprudent error or vain stupor of some move you, who, although they are involved in so grave a crime, are struck with blindness of mind, so that they neither understand nor lament their sins. This is the greater visitation of an angry God, as it is written, and God gave them the spirit of deadness. And again, they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them the working of error, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Unrighteously pleasing themselves, and mad with the alienation of a hardened heart, they despise the Lord's precepts, neglect the medicine for their wound, and will not repent. Thoughtless before their sin was acknowledged, after their sin they are obstinate, neither steadfast before nor suppliant afterwards. When they ought to have stood fast, they fell. When they ought to fall and prostrate themselves to God, they think they stand fast. They have taken peace for themselves of their own accord, when nobody granted it. Seduced by false promises and linked with apostates and unbelievers, they take hold of error instead of truth. They regard a communion as valid with those who are not communicants. They believe men against God, although they have not believed God against men. Flee from such men as much as you can, avoid with a wholesome caution those who adhere to their mischievous contact. Their word doth eat as doth a cancer, their conversation advances like a contagion, their noxious and envenomed persuasion kills worse than persecution itself. In such a case there remains only penitence which can make atonement, but they who take away repentance for a crime close the way of atonement. Thus it happens that, while by the rashness of some false safety is either promised or trusted, the hope of true safety is taken away. But you, beloved brethren, whose fear is ready towards God, and whose mind, although it is placed in the midst of a grievous lapse, is mindful of its misery, do you in repentance and grief look into your sins, acknowledge the very grave sin of your conscience, open the eyes of your heart to the understanding of your sin, neither despairing of the Lord's mercy, nor yet at once claiming his pardon. God, in proportion as with the affection of a father, he is always indulgent and good, in the same proportion is to be dreaded with the majesty of a judge. Even as we have sinned greatly, so let us greatly lament. To a deep wound, let there not be wanting a long and careful treatment. Let not the repentance be less than the sin. Think you that the Lord can be quickly appeased, whom with faithless words you have denied, to whom you have rather preferred your worldly estate, whose temple you have violated with a sacrilegious contact. Think you that he will easily have mercy upon you, whom you have declared not to be your God? You must pray more eagerly and entreat, you must spend the day in grief, wear out nights in watchings and weepings, occupy all your time in wailful lamentations. Lying stretched on the ground, you must cling close to the ashes, be surrounded with sackcloth and filth. After losing the raiment of Christ, you must be willing now to have no clothing. After the devil's meat, you must prefer fasting. Be earnest in righteous works, whereby sins may be purged. Frequently apply yourself to almsgiving, whereby souls are freed from death. What the adversary took from you, let Christ receive. Nor ought your estate now either to be held or loved, by which you have been both deceived and conquered. Wealth must be avoided as an enemy must be fled from as a robber, must be dreaded by its possessors as a sword and as poison. To this end only so much as remains should be of service, that by it the crime and the fault may be redeemed. Let good works be done without delay and largely. Let all your estate be laid out for the healing of your wound. 
Let us lend of our wealth and our means to the Lord, who shall judge concerning us. Thus faith flourished in the time of the apostles, thus the first people of believers kept Christ's commands. They were prompt, they were liberal, they gave their all to be distributed to the apostles, and yet they were not redeeming sins of such a character as these. If a man make prayer with his whole heart, if he groan with the true lamentations and tears of repentance, if he incline the Lord to pardon of his sin by righteousness and continual works, he who expressed his mercy in these words may pity such men. When you turn and lament, then shall you be saved, and shall know where you have been. And again, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord, but that he should return and live. And Joel the prophet declares the mercy of the Lord in the Lord's own admonition when he says, Turn ye to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and gracious and patient, and of great mercy, and repenteth him with respect to the evil that he hath inflicted. He can show mercy, he can turn back his judgment, he can mercifully pardon the repenting, the labouring, the beseeching sinner. He can regard as effectual whatever, in behalf of such as these, either martyrs have besought or priests have done, or, if any one move him still more by his own atonement, if he appease his anger, if he appease the wrath of an indignant God by righteous entreaty, he gives arms again whereby the vanquished may be armed, he restores and confirms the strength whereby the refreshed faith may be invigorated, the soldier will seek his contest anew, he will repeat the fight, he will provoke the enemy, and indeed by his very suffering he is made braver for the battle. He who has thus made atonement to God, he who by repentance for his deed, who by shame for his sin, has conceived more both of virtue and of faith from the very grief of his fall, heard and aided by the Lord, shall make the church, which he had lately saddened, glad, and shall now deserve of the Lord not only a pardon, but a crown. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.